Hello and welcome to Philippine Politics and Governance. I am Armin Rose and I will be your guide as you learn the concepts of this course. This is Lesson 10, Election and Political Parties. Now we have learned from the previous lessons that the Philippine government is made up of three uh, co-equal and separate bodies, the executive, legislative, and judicial branch, and power is decentralized through the local government units. Now, people who are in position of power are elected into office, and this is uh, a practice that we do every three or six years. The right of suffrage or the right to vote is defined in Section 1, Article 5 of the 1987 Constitution. This right is not a natural right but a privilege given to the citizens of a nation or state. This means that if you're not a citizen of the country, you're not allowed to vote in the elections. A suffrage is a powerful tool in the, of the people that involves the selection of public officials who will run the government and present their concerns through the laws proposed and supported in Congress. So in direct democracy, people vote on the actual programs and laws for these to be implemented. In representative democracy, people vote for candidates who they believe will support and implement the laws and programs that are important to them. The Philippines practices representative democracy. We choose the people and not the programs and the laws. In order to exercise your right to suffrage, you need to pass the qualifications to vote. So uh, we have to register as a voter first, and in order to register, we must meet these qualifications. First, you must be a citizen of the Philippines. You must be at least 18 years old and resided in the Philippines for at least one year or in the place where they intend to vote for at least six months. And they should also not otherwise be disqualified by law. Uh, for example, convicted criminals lose their right to vote for as long as they are serving their sentences. Also, people who have been citizens in another country will lose their right to vote in their original country or their, the country of their birth. No literacy, property, or other substantive requirement shall be imposed. This ensures that no person will be discriminated upon or disenfranchised, which means it's not be able to vote. Uh, even if they cannot read or write, if they have no job or no property, or if they are differently abled, like if they're deaf or blind, as long as they meet all the other qualifications above, then the government will ensure that they can practice their right to vote. The COMELEC, or Commission of Elections, is the agency that enforces and administers all laws and regulations relative to the conduct of elections. So some of these activities include voter registration, the filing of candidacy, the campaign period, voting, the canvassing of votes, declaration of winners, and uh, election complaints. Now, through all of these events, the COMELEC ensures that they are creating a budget, the, the proper bidding for materials, uh, printing of enough forms and ballots for all the voters, the screening of the candidates according to the qualifications of the positions they are running for, and uh, they also will ensure that there will be people who will assist and they will be in charge of the activities and also people who will be in charge or provide security during these events and also that these people will be paid properly. Uh, we only hear from COMELEC during election periods every three years, but uh, the office works continuously uh, all the other years. There are three types of electoral systems in order to choose uh, the winners of an election. The first type is called the plurality electoral system, wherein the candidate with the most number of votes is declared the winner 
even if they, done if they did not get the majority vote. So this is the one used by the Philippines in our elections. It's a winner-take-all setup wherein if there are 100 voters and three candidates, the first candidate gets 30 points, the second candidate gets 30 points, and the fourth and the third candidate get, gets 40 points, then the candidate who got 40 points will be the winner. If there are many winners to be announced, like in the senatorial race, so it's the race to the top. So if there are 24 senatorial positions, then the top 24 votes wins. So number 25 is out even if uh, number 24 and 25 are only separated by a small margin of votes. The second type of electoral system is the majority electoral system. In this system, the candidate must get a majority vote in order to win. A majority vote means 50% of all votes counted plus one. So if no one gets a majority vote, there will be a repeat of the election, but the candidates who got the lowest votes will be uh, eliminated in the second voting. So this is so that their votes will be transferred to the candidates who have higher percentages and only need a little bit more in order to get the majority vote. So for example, again, there are 100 votes. The first candidate gets 40 votes, the second candidate gets 40 votes, and the third candidate get, gets 20 votes, then the third candidate will not be eligible for, uh, for in the second election, and only the first two candidates will be eligible and they will be fighting for the 20% or the 20 votes that were that will be recounted from the third candidate that was uh, eliminated in the first count. The third type of electoral system is proportional representation, wherein the people will vote for parties and the parties would, will have the same percentage of positions in the government as the percentage of votes they got in the election. This is also a system that we use when we uh, elect party list representatives. So for example, again, if we have 100 votes, the first party will receive 70% of the votes. The second party will receive 30% of the votes. If there are 100 positions, then party the first party will get 70 positions and the second party will get 30 positions. Now that is the types of electoral systems. There are also three types of party systems. We have the one party system, wherein there is a monopoly of power. So there's only one part, ruling party in the country. Examples of this would be China, North Korea, and other communist countries. So the, the people only choose their leaders from that one party and other parties who try to fight the ruling party are disbanded. And sometimes the people who start these second or third parties will be jailed. The, the next type of party is the two-party system in which two parties are going against each, against each other for domination or, or majority rule in the government. Uh, the best example of this would be the United States of America, where they, they have two major parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. And it's only with these two parties that the people choose their president. Of course, there are other existing parties in the United States, but the best way that you can seal a seat in government is being a member of either of these two parties. The third type of party system is the multi-party system, wherein there are more than two parties who compete and have almost equal capabilities in affecting and winning the elections. This is what the Philippines use as the party system. 
uh, we used when we were under the American rule, we have two rule two major parties: the Nacionalista Nacionalista Party and the Liberal Party. But as the years went on, there are many more parties that sprung up, and every election we've had since 1986, uh, the president has come from a different party. The party list system is a mechanism of proportional representation in the election of representatives to the House of Representatives. Party list representatives comprise 20% of the total number of representatives in the House of Representatives. Uh, in the lesson about the legislative body, uh, there are 250 members of the House of Representatives and 20% of, of these should come from the party list, which means there is a maximum of 50 seats that are available for party list representatives. So we will explain more of this later when we talk about political parties. A political party refers to an organized group of citizens advocating an ideology or platform, principles and policies for the general conduct of government, and which, as the most immediate means of securing their adoption, regularly nominates and supports certain of its leaders and members as candidates for public office. So the these parties are the ones who will support the candidates in the candidacy and also during the term of office. One characteristic of a political party that distinguishes itself from other organizations is that while most groups focus on a single issue, a political party participates in all, all issues relative for government. The ruling party is the party of the president even if they don't have many seats in Congress or the local government. Now, these are the types of political parties in the Philippines. First, we have the National Party. The National Party has members that can be found all over the country, or at least a majority of the regions. So the presidential candidates and the senatorial and congressional candidates usually come from this type of par party. A regional party has members that can be found all over the region, or at least a majority of the cities and provinces comprising the region. Now, the local government candidates, like the mayor, the governor, uh, the barangay captains, can come from a national party, but usually they are part of a regional party. Now, the sectoral party has members belonging to the labor, peasant, fisher folk, urban poor, indigenous cultural communities, elderly, handicapped women, youth, veterans, overseas workers, and professionals, and whose personal principal advocacy pertains to the special interests and concerns of their sectors. So these are where the party list representatives in Congress come from. Uh, because uh, the majority of the congressmen or representatives have districts where they represent, but uh, it was realized that some of these uh, groups of people that I have mentioned are underrepresented in Congress, and therefore they have sectoral parties that will now uh, advocate for their needs and issues. A sectoral organization also refers, refers to a group of citizens or a coalition of groups of citizens who share similar physical attributes or characteristics, employment, interests, and concerns. So these are the people who will form the parties, the sectoral parties. A coalition refers to a group of duly registered national, regional, sectoral party or sectoral organization for political and election purposes. When parties have the same or at least aligned programs and ideologies, they can um, form coalitions in order for them to have a stronger or better chance for winning seats in, in the positions that they 
want to get. Uh, examples of coalitions would be the Ocho Derecho senatorial lineup in the previous election as well as the Rainbow Coalition in the previous elections. We have here uh, some points that we need to ponder on. So during election period, the practice of vote buying is reported in many precincts. So people supposedly accept bribes and sell their votes for an average of 2,000 pesos, but some for as little as low as 500 pesos. So if the candidate gets elected into position, he or she will spend six years in office. So there are things that we consider. You can talk to your to your classmates about this or any people in your household can give you ideas. The first question is, is it worth it how much the voter sold his or her vote? Uh, you can use math to do this. You, you, you compute 2,000 pesos or 500 pesos and divide it into uh, three or six years. And you will know how much they are selling their votes for. The second, what do you think are the consequences of having corrupt politicians in government? So here is where you will, will look at the values that are lost when corrupt politicians are running the government. And third, considering that you will be a voting age in the next elections, how can you ensure that you choose the right candidate? So use the scientific method in order to study each candidate, their history, their uh, personalities or characteristics, their education, their background, and all their advocacies. So you know, you, you, you can weigh each option correctly. And finally, we have your voting is both a right and a privilege, and it is a duty and responsibility. Voting is a right because it is given to all citizens. It's also a privilege because it is given exclusively to the citizens of a country. Voting is a duty that must be carried out in every election period. And voting is also a responsibility that should be taken seriously in order for the country to have a government that is sensitive and responsive to the people's needs. And the following are the reference materials used in the creation of this presentation and the ideas discussed in this video. So thank you for watching and see you in next lesson.